Okay, so let's let's get started. It's two o'clock. So for those of you who don't know me, my name's Leslie Morrissey. I do reputation marketing, which is a sort of posh name for um, content marketing. So I do a lot of work writing content for websites, for newsletters, and all kinds of other things that people use to promote their business, including email campaigns and blogs and social media and anything that's got words attached really. And I started out, I learned about um, how people tackle websites as far as their user experience is going. It's, it's commonly referred to as UX a very long time ago. And um, this is a sort of pull together of my learning, my um, common sense approach and a little bit of um, experience reading up on other people's experience as well so really it's all about how a website works effectively and what you can do to make it work better so if you think of your website as a three-legged stool so if you take a leg out of a stool it falls over if it's only got three legs in fact even if it's got four legs it, it tends to fall over but but typically a three-legged stool is is only stable while all the legs are working and, it, and the website has effectively got three legs. The first leg is what I call aesthetics and functionality. And that's the job of the web builder, the web designer and developer. And sometimes they're two people, sometimes they're the same person. And we have a little look at that, that I'm not one of those, but I know a little bit about it. So don't take me as gospel. You probably find this lots of people can give you even more information about it. The second step is the message and engagement, commonly referred to as UX, usability as well, which is what the engagement part of it is, is getting people to where they want to go as easily as possible. And the third leg is traffic, also known as search engine optimization. So again, I'm not an expert at that, but because of what I do, I've had to learn a bit about it. So um, this is a, a sort of overview of all of these. Clearly, there's a more in-depth bit which I'm more expert at, which is the message and the engagement end. But this is to sort of get everybody thinking about whether their website ticks the boxes that, that they need it to tick to work effectively. So who does what? So you you affect really you if you go to a website designer, they will design you a website. These days, most website designers use templates and they can put together a basic website in something like WordPress, but there are lots of others. If you if you do that, that's fine. If you've got a simple website, that's absolutely fine. However, if you've got something that's more complex and you need to have more complex elements in your website, like it might be booking or things like that, you will need a developer who can write the code that is bespoke for you. The so so that's the 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 aesthetics and the functionality and that the, the designer's job really is to make the website look gorgeous to make it look appealing when people land on it the some website designers will write content but the majority will ask you to provide your content and if you're not a professional copywriter that's an area that whilst you know what you want to say getting it in words that engage your audience is a bit of a challenge and it does de depend on you actually knowing who the audience are, what the audience want and how they want to approach it so that you deliver the information and your message in the way they want to get it, not the way you want to put it over. So we'll talk a little bit about that later. And thirdly, there's an SEO expert. So if you want your website to get found, search engine optimization is quite important. These days, um, you'll find that quite a lot of there's plugins and things for WordPress, if you've got a WordPress site, so you can get Yoast and things like that, that will help you to optimize the website and will tell you the level of your content, whether it's red, green or, or amber, um, allowing you to sort of tweak it a bit and so on. But there's a lot more to it than that. Um, and as again, as again, I'm not the expert, but it's important that you know not what you think people will look for, 
but what you've researched that people look for. And there's a big difference because we all think we know what our business is about. So for instance, when I started out, I thought, well, readability, it's readability. Nobody searches for readability. OK, <laughs> they don't know what well, uh, people know what it is when you say, but they don't actually use that phrase. So and typically people don't search on a word. They search on a phrase. And, you know, in in the people call it keywords. I actually think you're better looking at key phrases. We'll talk a little bit about how you can do some simple SEO yourself without your brain going into meltdown. So those are the three areas. And the first thing, there's aesthetics. There's so many different ways of putting a website together. And obviously, fashions change. Um, I, I don't always agree with some of the fashions, but, I, you know, we're all allowed our opinions. And I think that, um, for instance, a sense of text does my head in because it's much harder to read. But that's the fashion these days. So um, unless you could persuade your designer to rearrange your text in a way that meets your particular needs, then that's, you know, one of these is where often your designer will offer you some templates to look at and you can choose one that works for you. So most of these things are fixable. So they're not, you don't have to have exactly what's there, but if you like the look and feel of a website, then, then that's what, it, what you would be looking for. And I always say, if you want a good website, one that makes you feel, yeah, that's, that's a, represents my organization really well, you need to give the designer a brief. Now, it's, it's all very well saying, oh, well, um, they're the designer, they're the ones that should come up with it. But if you're faced with a blank sheet of paper, it's a big ask. So I would say, have a look around the web, find websites you like, and rather than just give your designer a list of half a dozen websites to say, I like these, because they'll look at them and they'll go, well, they're all very different. W which bits do you like? So I would say, look at the website and say what it is you like about it, because a good designer can integrate that into their design and they can go, OK, so they like having a single color theme throughout. They like having um, a lot of images in it. They like having clear headlines and so on. So it's helping to get, get the brief right so that what you get is m closer to what you want and you don't get the, the result at the end of the day saying, well, it's all right, but yeah, well, I'll put up with it because that isn't what you want. You want something you're proud of really. So the functionality is all that gobbledygook that clever people write in the background. <laughs> and uh, um, I, I'm, I'm in the little knowledge is a dangerous thing category when it comes to code. I know a little tiny bit of HTML, but unless it does what I want to do, want it to do in the, the first time round, I, I wouldn't know where to fix it. So, um, and, and that's really sits behind your website. And as I say, these days, templates mean you don't need to fiddle around with code. Um, the only code you might need is if you're going to put a lead magnet on your site and you're using one of the email marketing platforms like a Weber or Constant Contact or GetResponse or MailerLite or one of those, you can get the code for your form and insert it onto your website. Um, and generally, I give it to my web designer guy and he does it for me because he, he knows where to put it. He knows how to make it appear where I want it to. So, but, but that's the back end of your website is it, it's what makes it jump through the hoops that you want the website to jump through. And it's what gets your user when they click on something from where they are to where they want to go. So usability. Um, this is the user experience. Now, there's all kinds of experts in this. The, the big guns are people like Jakob Nielsen of the Nielsen Norman Group. And, you know, I read a lot of his stuff, but I do find it gets quite technical. And he does things like heat maps and things, which we'll look at in a minute. I think the, the usability guy that I like best is Steve Krug. We'll look at his stuff as well in a minute. He's more common sense. He's more accessible for people who don't speak technology. So this is what a heat map looks like. And people who 
you probably wouldn't do this for for a you know local business site but if you're a big business you want to know how people behave on your website and basically what they do is they use eye tracking software so they can see where people look and all the green bits are where people look and the red and the yellow bits are where they look most so that's where the 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 biggest you know site is going into that particular area so there must be a headline there that attracts people's attention and gets them to want to read that bit and this is a pretty plain website so it's not you know there's there's not a lot of things to di misdirect people so if you've got a lot going on on the page you'll find the eye tracking will pop all over the page randomly and you because this this is this is a typical f shape it's you know that's how people actually read websites they they read out and then down and then out so they tend to go down the left hand edge providing their english readers obviously if you're arabic you do it back to front um and i think it's it chinese chinese depending on what kind of chinese goes top to bottom but some chinese also goes left to right so it, it simplified chinese so it sort of reads in the same format as as english but that's just by the way so you you need things to direct them and if you look the the hot bits are where the headings are you know it gets hotter where there's bold letters so then you've got the message now that if you've got you know you've got these three elements and if the website looks fabulous and you've got a, a really strong message it's not very useful if no traffic comes to it but then if you've got tons of traffic and people take one look and say, God, this website looks a bit amateurish and go away again, then it's you, you, know, you may be paying for your SEO and that will take a lot of money out of your bank account for no good reason. Um, and if, even if it looks lovely and you've got lots of traffic, if the message doesn't grab people's attention, again, they bounce off it. So the three have to work together. It has to have all three. Otherwise, the stool falls over. So the first thing you need to know, and this is a question I ask my clients all the time, is who are you talking to? Who is it that you're trying to reach? Because if you don't know, you're trying to create a message that reaches anybody and everybody, and it's just not focused enough. So you really need to know your target audience. You need to know who they are, what they're interested in, how you can help them, what their problems are, what keeps them awake at night, what is it they want to get rid of out of their lives that you can actually do for them and make things easier? And at the end of the day, what will that mean to them? Not just, well, it, it could be better for them because that's that means nothing. It, it, I say, if you're going to have a benefit, you can say, so what? You haven't got there yet. So why will it be better for them? Because those are the things you will use to write your content. That, that's what you use in your headlines and you use in your, in your subheadings. And, and it will attract people because they go, yeah, that's me. That's my problem. So they need to have the what's in it for me. You know, what? why should I use your services? What are you going to give me that I haven't got at the moment that I need? that will actually make my life less hassle in some way, shape or form. And if you can't nail that down, your message won't be as strong. It won't be as powerful to get people engaged. So I don't know if you, you've heard the phrase persuasion and influence. And actually, if it's down to it, it's a sales process. I, I, in another lifetime as a management trainer, and I used to teach people communication skills. And one of the things that we actually used to go through was how to persuade people to do something. And basically, it is exactly the same as the sales process. You first have to make that first connection with them where they feel like you're on the same wavelength. And that's what your website has to do. You have to present it to people so they go, yeah, this feels right to me. Yeah, this, this sounds like my kind of people. Um, and and you know, everybody is different. So some people are, are more formal, some people are more casual. The language has to reflect the kind of organization you are. Because otherwise, if you've got a very formal corporate website, and yet when people meet you, you're very open, friendly, down to earth, chatty, 
there's a disconnect. It's like, oh, that doesn't sort of match what I was expecting. So that rapport building is important. Then you've got to establish your credibility. Um, often a blog is a great way to do this because it shows off your knowledge and your expertise. Clearly, you can do that with social media as well. But it bring, if you can bring people back to your blog through your social media, that's even better. Um, it's understanding the client. It's, it's showing them that you do get where they're at. And that's where your message is important that you show that your message says I get that you've got this problem and I can solve it for you um, and then it's got and then solutions now I, I understand a website is is not really to tell them the answer to the question it's to get them to contact you but there has to they have to see that there's some point in doing that so you have to be able to say to them here you are I get the problem we can fix it for you. We fixed it for other people. You might have a quote. A, a, I always say third party validation is very powerful. If you've got testimonials from clients, put them on the page where you're talking about the service that client got, not on a separate testimonials page. So you may you may offer three or four different services or products or more. Um, I, I would put a testimonial on each of those pages relevant to that service or that product, rather than expect people to go to a page, read all the testimonials, find the one that's relevant for them, because they won't. I mean, let, let's be honest, if you go to a testimonials page, how many do you read? If there's a long list, you read the first two or three, maybe. And if you don't find one that's relevant, you just go away again. So I would put it where people are reading about the service you're offering or the, or the product you're, you're offering. And that's how, how you look at your website. You need to take them through that persuasive process to they take action. There's a chap called Guy Levine, who I met a couple of times and I've been on some of his tele seminars, which take me, that dates me very much because these were webinars, but they weren't on the web, they were on telephone. Um, and he said, I hate websites that have been weed all over. And I thought that was quite cute. And basically what he was meant was when we write websites, we talk about ourselves a lot. We say we, 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 we can do this. We can help you with that. We deliver this service. We can, we've helped clients with that. It should never be on your website. You should need to reposition your content so that it's all focused on you, the reader. So instead of we do this, it's you can have that. So it's a subtle change. But if you if you think about how most of us respond, the minute somebody says you, your ears perk up because you, they, you think they're talking about you and we're all interested in ourselves. So if they're describing something that you can have, that little video film in your head starts to run with you in a starring role, experiencing whatever they're talking about. If they say, we can do this, that's got nothing to do with you. The engagement level is far lower. So if you've got a website that's got your company name all over it, and it's got your um, we this, we that, think about rewriting it so that it's more user focused. I'm not saying never use we, but the, the, the ratio needs to be far higher on the you end of it to the we end of it. So engagement, it's about telling people what they need to know, really. And it's, it's as simple as that. The headline needs to capture attention. And things like, you know, scrolling marquees at the top, which is those slider things that go from, you know, whizzing and stop and then whizzing again. And I'll talk about those a little bit more in, in a minute. But the headlines on those are often very bland. They're sort of top class insurance for business. That means nothing. I, I would have something much more personal and much more powerful that says, is your business suffering from unnecessary risk? Because people go, oh, I don't know, is it? And then they want to read some more. So 
that's the kind of thing you need to be looking at is something that will grab attention and pull people into the into your website so they want to go and find out some more and every page needs a headline so you know the, i ha i'll get on my soapbox about things that, that don't constitute a headline in just a moment but the engagement is really important because if people aren't engaged they bounce off your site really quickly this is a book that um, Steve Krug wrote, and I've got a couple of versions of this. I've got the, the more recent one. If you want something that is very readable, it is not rocket science. It is really, he actually has written a book about rocket surgery, I think as well, but that's usability for corporates, which is probably a bit beyond most of us. Um, but the Don't Make Me Think book is brilliant. And what he's saying basically is you, you really don't need to be too clever on your website. So things like on your navigation, for instance, if you've got um, jobs, people know that that's where they go to look to see if you've got any vacancies. If it says work opportunities, there's a nanosecond while they think, Oh yeah, that's jobs. If it says something cute and clever like Jobarama, they go, what? <laughs> and they ignore it. So it is about sticking to the basics. So I would say, you know, if you've got an about page and you've got a contact page, then that's what should be on there. And, and it should be either about us and contact us or about and contact. And most people are happy with about and contact and you know, are, are happy to have a slimmer menu than one that's got extra words in it. Um, but who we are doesn't cut it on a menu. It really doesn't. So if that's what's on your menu at the moment, I apologize if I'm insulting you, but just get back to basics. <laughs> and, and, and it is about, because I, the first website I ever wrote, we had a who we are, what we do, um, what else was it? Oh, yes, we had a passion statement, it's not a mission statement. Nobody ever looked at those pages because they meant nothing. They just wanted to know what courses do you deliver? <laughs> this is it. And so there should have been things that said courses and about. And it's as simple as that. And contact always needs to be visible not hidden in another menu. People need to be able, be able to get hold of you easily. So barriers to watch out for. These are the things that um, people do. And, and this, is, this is where I'm going to get on my soapbox. I apologize. So <laughs> page names instead of headlines. Now, your SEO person will tell you that having the page name as the headline, as the H1 tag, is important for search engines. And they're right. But what they won't tell you is that the H1 tag doesn't have to be 24 points or bold. It can be 10 points and tiny. The headline for the read reader can be the H2 tag, which is the headline too. And that can be 24 point and bold and stand out because the human being that lands on the page wants to see the most hooky, the thing that hooks them in, in the biggest letters. The search engine that lands on the page is looking for the H1 tag and whatever that says is what they think is the most important thing on the page. So you can actually satisfy both those audiences easily but you will sometimes get you know, designers and developers who go, the H1 has, tag has to be the page name. Yes, maybe it does, but it doesn't have to be the biggest heading on the page. And what you want is the headline that people read and go, I need to read some more about that. Let's be honest, if you've clicked on something that says services, where do you expect to be on the services page? And if you're not on the services page, then there's something seriously wrong with the website. But so that's that's number one. Number two, headlines in capitals or a capital for each word. Now I know this, the Americans love their capital letters for every word, but I learned a very long time ago that 
um, headlines all in capitals are harder to read. Um, for the way the human brain processes information, all the letters are the same size. So they're, they're sort of little blocks. And I, I'd done this myself when I was um, back in the mists of time before websites became sort of common. This was back in 1980 something. And I'd done a newsletter for the company I worked for at the time. And we were working with an ad agency, J. Walter Thompson, which is one of the big ones. And I sent this newsletter typed up on my electronic typewriter, because that's what I had in those days, uh, for them to lay out and create as a um, galley for a, a sort of proof for us to look at, as what it would actually look like when it was printed. And um, this was a day four, but it was, it was a big prestigious organization. We had hundreds of staff and lots of people who would be looking at this. So back came this galley, and my carefully typed in capitals headline was then typed in Sonson's case. So I went, oh, and obviously looking at what they're doing, thinking I knew it all, picked the phone up and called the account executive and said, oh, you've, you've changed my headline into, into lowercase, and why have you done that? And he said, well, because he said, do you want people to read it? I said, of course I do, but it's a headline. He said, yes, and it's in a headline font. It's big and it's bold, and um, but it needs to be in sentence case so people can read it because they can't read the capital. So I went, oh, okay. Um, but then each word should have a capital. And he said, yes, if you want people to read it one word at a time. And I said, sorry? He said, quite. <laughs> so I went, okay, lesson learned, um, phone down, red face. <laughs> But, but it was interesting because that's, every time you've got a capital, it stops the eye. So you don't read fluently. So having a headline that's even each, each word has a capital letter means you don't read the sense of it as easily. And I know it's minimal, but everything that creates a barrier is not good. Okay, candy floss in, images, or as a friend of mine calls them, they're there for eye candy. Images on a website page are really important because they give the page life and energy, but they need to be relevant. And the number of websites I've got that have got, I don't know, flowers, piles of stones are quite common, a hand holding out a, a plant growing, you know, the stock images, people are going, oh, that looks, that, that looks nice, that's sort of, that's relevant to my business-ish maybe. Uh, they're not helpful. And you know, if if you're you've got real estate, you need it all to be working as hard as possible. So if you're going to have an image, and I, I do advise that you have images, make sure there's something that helps to get the message across, so that they're not there just as decoration. I did see one website, and it was an HR company, and they they clearly liked butterflies. Now I love butterflies, as anybody who knows me, I've got tattoos of butterflies. I've got bags of butterflies, I've got earrings of butterflies, but they're not on my website, but they have them on their website. And some clever web developer had, in, had done some code. And when you the website opened, this butterfly took off from their logo and flapped its way around the, the page and landed on the bottom right, which was a bit disconcerting, but okay except that every time you went to a new page, it did it again. It was really irritating <laughs> to the point that I went, nope, I'm gonna shut that one down. I just can't be asked for that, sorry. <laughs> so images need to work for you. Um, this is what I was just saying, things that move. Things that move once and stop are fine. Things that move and stop, then move and stop are distracting. And that's why I'm not a big fan of sliders because that's exactly what they do. And if people are on the same screen and they can see the slider and they're trying to read text, every time it moves, they stop reading because their eye flicks back up. Then they have to find their place again and people won't give it more than a couple of goes. They just get frustrated. And interestingly, as we read on a subconscious level, the brain tells you that the information you're reading is difficult. It may not be, may be great, but because you keep getting pulled away from it, it means that you keep having to re-engage with it all the time. It's not good news. So if you can 
persuade your web designer, specifically probably a web developer will be needed, um, to have those changing pictures to fade gently out and gently in with an almost continuous movement, you'll find that the reader's brain can process that much better and it doesn't actually move them away from the message that they're trying to process underneath it. Light writing on a dark background. So sexy black websites with white writing look sexy, but they're really hard to read. Mainly because what happens when you've got no, if it's a big, bold headline, that's fine. Because generally that's a bigger, bigger font and it, each letter has a shape to it with two sides. But when you're talking about 12 point normal text, it cuts the background up and it creates a slight dazzle effect. Some people get it more than others, but anything that gets in the way is not good. So what happens then is your brain's working quite hard to process the writing and is comprehension goes down. So if you've got a nice black background, have a lighter colored box where your writing is or put something under it that's got a light background. So the writing is darker than the background it's on. Mystery Meat Navigation, this is what I was talking about earlier. This is um, Vic Sanders uh, phrase. He's another one that um, he, he, he wrote a book and he had a website called Web Pages That Suck. But this was quite a long time ago and I'm not sure how current it is at the moment. But basically it's things on tabs that people have no idea what they mean. And they have to make a guess at what that navigation actually, where it would take you. So, you know, this is why I say you need a page that says services, not what we do. And I know what we do says the same thing, but it's not as clear. And services is one word, what we do is three words. It just takes up more space. Your menu starts to look tatty. So, Whatever you decide to put on your navigation, make sure that it's a clear representation of something the reader will recognize. And I know in our industries, we all have our own jargon and our own ways of doing things, but you need something the reader will recognize. So if they, like with my readability, you know, if they have no clue what that means, unless it's explained to them, don't use it. Hunt the thimble navigation. That's where the page that you want isn't on the menu. So it's it's hidden somewhere and you have to scroll down a page and find a link or you have to look in other menus. And, you know, the, the, the most common one is where people have a, an about section and the, for some reason they've put the contact page in the about section as a sub menu. Now, you know, if I want to get in touch with you, I don't have to try hard. Actually, I would put your phone number in your whatever way you want people to contact you at the top of, the, of every page on the part of the, your banner headline. But the contact page should be, usually it's the last, um, on, on the right hand side, the last menu option. And it should be easy for people to just click on, go there, fill in your, your inquiry form if they want to, or there should be other means of contacting you if, they, if that's what you want them to do. Now, clearly not everybody wants to be rung up by everybody, but if you can put a phone number on and you've got the wherewithal to answer calls, then do that. Um, otherwise, ask people to give, you a, give them a time that, they, that you can ring them back. And you can put that into your form. Okay, this may seem a bit bizarre. Images to the left of the text. So if you're looking at a page and the image is on the left and the writing is on the right, you have to consider how people processing this. Now, most people reading English read from left to right, which is why left aligned text is better than centered text because it's, e it's, it's a point that you keep your eye comes back to easily rather than having to search for the beginning of each line. I know a lot of web designers who used to be, probably not so much now, but used to be very keen on justified text because from an aesthetic point of view, it's a nice tidy square. But unfortunately, it's easy for the reader to lose their place when all the lines are the same length. 
because the brain sort of takes this clever little snapshot of the shape of the paragraph and roughly knows where it is. Whereas if all the lines look the same, when you get longer paragraphs and you get to about line four, it's very easy to read the same line again. But the, the reason the images to the left don't work as well is if you've got them in the text, so you've got text alongside and underneath, what happens is we scan images on screen downwards, generally. The eye moves from the top to the bottom of the image. It's different for a painting. From painting on a wall, you would go into it from the bottom left and work across it. But actually, on a screen, we tend to scan downwards. And if your eye moves down the image, the tendency is to read what's underneath the image. Now, if your introduction and you're setting your scene up is on the side of the image, some people won't read it. So it's better to have the text on the left and read into the image so they still see the image, but the image isn't the most important thing. The text is the most important thing because that's where the message is. An image should be useful, but it won't tell the whole story. And then people will read from the top downwards, not down a picture and read. start reading halfway down the, the text. Right, what's a CTA you may say? It's a call to action. And I'm always astonished at the number of websites that I look at that have no call to action. They have lots of information and it doesn't say at any point, now do this. Every single page should have a call to action. Your home page probably has more than one, but I would recommend that where you've got individual services or, or product pages, don't ask them to do more than one thing. You know, it's ring us or email us, that's it, or click here or whatever it is. Tell people what to do and make it easy for them to do it. So if you say, call us for more information, you put call us on and the phone number for more information. Because that makes, you know, they don't have to then search. It's right under their noses. It's easier for people to take action, which means more people will. Because there's always the, the, you know, oh yeah, I must, uh, I'll get around to that. I just need to read a bit more. I need to find something else. And they don't do it. Then they forget and they get distracted. And we've all been there. So a call to action is really important. So you need to, when you're writing your pages, what do you want people to do when they finished reading it? Or at whatever point during the page, do you want to tell them, now you need to do this? Because if you don't tell them, some people will just go, oh, that was interesting, and they've gone. <laughs> they don't actually do anything. Okay. Traffic. This is just a little bit. These are some of the sites that are really useful if you're going to try and do your own traffic. One is answerthepublic.com. Now, some people call it Ask the Public. It isn't. It's called answerthepublic.com. And if you put your keywords in, your service or whatever it is, it tells you all the questions that people ask around that keyword, which is really, really useful because it gives you lots of ideas for content, the things that people are actually looking for. The questions that if you answer them, there's a chance that will come up in, in searches. There's also a thing called Keywords Everywhere, which is a little, um, it's a, it's a, a little thing that you install in your Chrome. It only works in Chrome, but it also, if you search for something, it will give you a list of all the other things that people search on around that, which is quite handy. And you get a whole bunch of free searches, and I think it's about $10 for thousands. So it's, it's worth having. And it, every time you do a search in Chrome, it shows you all the other options. Um, another one is ubersuggest.com, which is uh, fairly straightforward. It's a, it, again, you put in your words and it'll give you lots of other options. And uh, it's easy to get overwhelmed with, with search engine terms, you know, because you put one thing in and you get thousands. I would say take the top 10, top 10 or 12 and, and focus on those. Because yes, of course, there are all kinds of other things that people ser search for, but it's the ones that you want, the ones that are most searched for. And the other thing is Google itself. If you do a search on Google for your keywords, you go to the bottom of the page, you'll see that it says people also searched for at the bottom of the page. And there's some other alternatives. So 
I'm not suggesting you get to be an expert on SEO, but knowing what people are searching for will help you to write the content for your site that gets you in the searches when they're searching, if that makes sense. So how to get the website that will work for your business. This is your checklist. Research websites that you like and, you know, make sure that you understand what it is you like about them. Create customer avatars. So know who it is you're trying to reach and what it is they're looking for. Provide your web people with company color references and fonts. So at least whatever they do, it is pretty good and it matches your everything else that you put out there um, and it's surprising how many people's company colors may be black and red and the, the website start green for some bizarre reason you know and you think well because that's what the website designer decided would look nice you know um, decide on pages and sections in other words what's your website map going to look like and really whilst your designer will do that they're, they're doing it without knowledge. You, you've got the knowledge. I use um, smart art hierarchies to draw mine up. So it looks a bit like an organizational chart with a homepage at the top, the main pages on the, the manager level, and then the sub pages underneath that. And it works quite well because people can see how things are organized. And you can have pages, one page, but you can get at it from two different places if it's relevant. Choose your images and think carefully about them. Now, there's, you know, you don't have to have original images. If you can have them, that's fantastic. If you've got, you know, a tame photographer that will photograph the things you want and have original images, brilliant. Um, but for most people, that's quite a big budget item. Um, there's lots of sites that you can get images. There's, there's ones you pay for and there's ones you don't have to pay for. Personally, I quite often look on pixabay.com, on pexels.com, on freeimages.com, and um, what's the other one that we, we use, unsplash.com. And they're all free, they're royalty free, so you don't have to pay for any of those. Plan your user journeys. Think like your potential client or customer. When they land on your website, what are they going to want? Where can you take them easily to make it the most easy, a painless journey from landing to where they want to go. So you have to think not what you want to tell them, but what they want to know. Track down potential client locations. So where do your potential clients hang out? Make sure that you know, you're know you active in those areas and so that they get to see your website, maybe on social media, in groups or something like that. You know, it's, it shouldn't be a well-kept secret. It needs to be out there in the marketplace where everybody can see it in as many places as possible. Don't be shy. And finally, test everything. Make sure you go through your website and click on all the links when it's new and make sure they work. And then do it again every month or so because links break. And sometimes, you know, you go in your website and we often don't go to our own websites and somebody will email you who knows you and say, your website's down. Oh, my God, is it? <laughs> or there's a link on such and such a page that's broken. Now, if you've got friends that tell you that, that's great. But your customer ain't going to tell you that. Your customer will just go somewhere else. So do test your stuff. So your website's your shop window. Um, and that's my thoughts on websites and how you can make them work really well for you. And, and a lot of it is just little tweaks. It's not anything, you know, rocket science-y. It is little tweaks. And it's just knowing how to think when you're putting it together. And it's really hard to do when you're sitting behind the company to think like the person who's on the other side. So that's my take on it. Um, I hope that's been useful. If you have any questions, I'm happy for you to ask.